Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, that was weak. I'm telling you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> what a beautiful day today we have. I'm enjoying that sunshine out there. You know, I like it so much we ought to go out on the parking lot and have church this morning, huh? <laughs> Brian was telling me earlier this morning when he lived in uh, Colorado Springs, they had 300 days a year of sunshine. Wouldn't it be nice? I think we have 350 days of clouds around here. So it's nice to have a nice sunny day, and particularly when it comes on a Sunday when you and I can come to worship the Lord. And it's great to be in God's house. And thank you for inviting me back again this morning as we celebrate the Lord together, as we have already done this morning in our worship time. You know, it's, um, now it's right into the month of February. We're far enough away from New Year's Day that most all of us by now have broken all of our New Year's resolutions, haven't we? You know, that one to lose weight, to exercise more, and to not eat chocolate. Uh, I can tell you've already broken that, haven't you? Kind of getting our way into the new year, kind of feeling our way as to where we are and where we're going and all those things. I want to talk to us this morning. And when I think about that, about here this year of 2020, it's how you and I can make 2020 a good year and how we should live in the year that's before us. Now, we're already just about, what, about five or six weeks into it. Let's, uh, let's look ahead and see what we, what, what we can do to make this new year the year that God would want it to be. Background reading this morning, I'll not be reading from it, but the background reading is Daniel chapter 5. It's one of those uh, chapters you ought to read sometimes this afternoon or this week in your devotions. Daniel, see Daniel the name of a book after you, didn't they, huh? Daniel chapter 5 will be our background for, for the morning. But, but let me remind you about 2019. 2019, you know, was a very, very eventful year for all of us. Uh, well, you know, I, in many ways, 2019 was a very tragic year. Uh, the, epi uh, the opioid epidemic that was sweeping the, the nation then and continues to sweep. I don't know about you, but I watched the news last weekend in a 24-hour period in, in uh, Franklin County, Ohio, 10 overdose deaths just in 24 hours. <laughs> In my little city of Mount Vernon, there, there, we, we, we're finding all kinds of people for, uh, that are experiencing the opioid crisis and, and the deaths. And what can we say about all the tragic shootings that took place during 2019? School shootings, which almost seems like an everyday occurrence uh, as it happens. Shootings in our cities, I think we're most familiar recently with the shooting in Dayton, Ohio, just a few months ago, and all kinds of problems that are going along there. Discord in our nation, political discord all over the place with our country seemingly torn, torn apart, and we face that on a regular, everyday kind of a basis. And we continue to read about corporate scandals and sex scandals by prominent athletes and abuse scandals in the Catholic Church and political scandals on both sides of the aisle in not only our state, but of course in the nation as well. And if you're a weather watcher, as we all tend to be these days, you know that in 2019 we had all kinds of crazy weather all over the world. As a matter of fact, there were so many tropical storms and so many hurricanes that we sort of run out of old alphabet, alphabet so we can list the names there. And sometimes we have to go to the Greek alphabet to be able to pick up some of the things that, uh, that name those storms and those hurricanes that we've been having. 2019, very, very important year for all of us as we look back. Lost a lot of people during those days. I uh, sat down the other day and picked up a pictorial directory from First Church of the Nazarene where I pastored for so many years and just began to count up the people who had just died over the past year. It was amazing to me, the folks that we have lost. And so 2019, an eventful year. And what can we say this morning about uh, all, all the other things that have happened to us and to our families? And as we look back, we begin to wonder how in the world do we make it through the year it was called 2019, quite a year for all of us. But this morning, what can we say about uh, what's, what is the year 2020 going to bring to us? You know, you, people are already predicting what's going to be happening during this coming year. 
And you cannot write in a popular magazine unless you predict what's going to happen in the year ahead of us. But my question is, where are those very same people when the year is finally over and we try to match their predictions with what really happened during the year? So I asked this morning, what is the year 2020 going to bring to us? Now, let me be very honest this morning. I, it may sound like I'm on a downer this morning, but I'm really not. But the fact of the matter is, we don't have the promise of 2020. We've now had about six weeks of 2020 for us, and that's really all that we can be certain of. No, not one of us has a promise for this new year. Uh, you and I don't even know who's going to be here at the end of this, this current year. We don't even know what's going to happen this afternoon, much less what's going to happen for the rest of the year. Well, there's a very interesting story found for us in the Old Testament book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 5. The Bible tells us Daniel is in the court of King Belshazzar. Daniel is one of those who have been taken captive to Babylon, and he's serving in the court of the king, and had served there for many years. The king was giving a banquet, during the, and during that banquet, he, he had his servants go into the treasury there and to bring out all the gold goblets and various things that had been taken out of the temple of Jerusalem. And Daniel and the other exiles were living and working in that kind of a court, and they were having very di great difficulty with it. And they were having what amounted to an oriental orgy that night that lasted well into the night, and Belshazzar was enjoying all of his prestige and his power. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of that drunken orgy, they saw a hand. A hand that began to write on the wall. The story is fully recounted for us in Daniel chapter 5. And that hand wrote these words. Many, many, tekel parson. Everybody looked. Everybody saw that hand there, and everybody asked themselves, what in the world does that mean? Do you know that language? And they'd look at each other and say, no, we never had that in school, and nobody knew how to interpret that. Finally, somebody said, get Daniel. And so they ran and got Daniel, they brought him to the banquet hall, and that very clear-eyed Hebrew man saw the words written on the wall, and he interpreted it simply as saying, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Now, now we've used that, that term a lot in our own lives. We say about a certain individual, well, I, I guess he saw the handwriting on the wall. Or we say things like, well, it just doesn't balance out. But think about that again. That's the way they measured things back in those ancient marketplaces. And they would put some weights on one side of the scale, and then they'd take the grain or the meat or whatever they had, and they'd put it on the other side of the scale until it balanced out. And so they would determine the value of an item by how much that it weighed. Now, let's say this morning, as God does, that that applies to our lives. Let's just suppose this morning that I had this giant scale in my hand this morning, and, and suppose we put over on one side your life, your involvement, your time and your energy. Uh, let's say we put over there your life with all of his attitudes and the way that you relate to people, and we put it all over there on the other side, on one side of that giant scale, and we loaded that up with your commitment or your lack of commitment, and then let's put on the other side of the scale you and me by ourselves. Are we heavy enough to balance it out? Or do we simply find that no matter what we do or no matter how we think, we just don't balance things up right? Now, I know that in our time and day we say, now, wait a minute, Pastor Mike. Uh, you know, I, ha I have good intentions. My Mike, I'm going to. And after all, I I'm spiritual. 
But somehow those things just don't lift the weights. And then we hear the old gospel, you know, the old gospel, the gospel that we heard in church when we were growing up. And at the core of all that, that culturalism that we push off to the side, there's the core to the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus Christ says that no matter what you are and no matter what you do and no matter what, how good our intentions are, we will never be able to balance the scales by ourselves. And so for the Christian, he or she only has one alternative, and that is to ask Jesus Christ to come and get on the scales with me and appropriate the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the power of Jesus Christ. Not, not the power of a New Age philosophy or the power of our questions nor the power of our political commitments, but the power of the sacrifice of Christ. And when we ask Jesus Christ to get on the scales, he helps balance out things for us. Amen. Amen. Now the question is, if you and I knew this Sunday morning, the ninth day of February 2020, if we knew that this was our only year and our last year, if I could give you this morning a letter from God that says, this year is your only year. The question is, how would you live it? How would you live it? Well, I want to tell you the first thing that I would do if I were not a follower of Jesus Christ, the first thing that I would do is that I would commit to Christ and I would commit to his church. The pastor that I know received a telephone call from a family that he had known for a very, very long time. Father of that family had died, and he had been a mentor to that pastor when the pastor was a younger man. And, and they said, you know, he, he died two weeks ago, and we're going to have a memorial service for him. And he requested before he died that you be part of that memorial service. Can you come? Well... They had been close down through the years, and he was glad to do that. And the pastor continued to talk with a family member who had called him and because she was planning the service. Her father had been a very strong, committed Christian. He had been a scholar and a teacher, and many of the things that pastor believed he had learned from that, that man. And so the daughter said to the pastor, you know, I don't have the uh, expression of faith the way that my father had. And then she went on to say, but you know, I'm spiritual. And everything in him just sort of jammed up. And out of respect to her and her family, he said, you know, I, I wasn't going to preach to her on the phone, but someday I will. Do you realize this morning that seems to be the one thing that floats around in our society? People talk about us and they say, well, you know, Pastor Mike, I, I'm spiritual. I, I'm spiritual. And I want to say to them, good for you. Good for you. So are pantheists. So are New Agers. So are a lot of people. But nowhere in the Bible does it say, repent and be spiritual. You see, being spiritual, having good intentions, thinking good thoughts and doing good things, trying as hard as I can, will not balance the scales. To balance the scales, you have to say yes to Jesus Christ and invite him into your heart. And if that commitment means anything, you will express that commitment to a local church. And I want to tell you this morning, I don't give very much to people who say they have a Christianity that is not anchored to a local church. In fact, it will not last very long. The flame will go out because it's a false Christianity. You remember with me that the New Testament is made up primarily of letters that were written to churches. And I, for one, don't give much credibility if you're not anchored somehow to a church. So if I knew today that this year, 2020, was my last year, I would be committed to Jesus Christ and committed to his church. The second thing I would do is this. I'd spend time each day with Jesus. I'd spend time each day with him. You know, beginnings are important. They're just very important. 
If you don't get off to a good start, you're going to spend the rest of your time just trying to line things up as they should be. But if you begin the day with God, you just sort of put a bracket around the day. You, you ever listen to some singers trying to sing the national anthem at a football game or a baseball game? Uh, some time ago, I was, I was watching, you know, and here was this singer, and she never did find the notes. I mean, she just never did. She'd go way up, you know, and she'd go right past the right note and just keep on going. And then she started coming down, and I think, out of girl, you're going to get there. And, and she'd just come right on down and, and really never got it right. And trying to do a jazz rendition of the national anthem is ludicrous. But you know, that's the way our day, our, our day is. If we don't begin right with God, we just can't get on track. Amen. William Osler, when speaking to the graduating class of Yale University, said, what one, de what one does in the first 20 minutes of his or her day determines the whole day. Did you get that? What one does in the first 20 minutes of his or her day determines the whole day. And I think we need to understand that, that, that we have a fight, you know, we have to fight to keep that. You know, a 10 or, or a 15 or a 30 minute beginning of the day to keep it sacred so we, we can begin with God. Because I believe that if we don't come apart in order to be with God... We will come apart. And many of us have not learned that lesson very well. And many people wonder why they so often find themselves in tatters in their life. Well, one pastor I, I heard about, I, I really never had the courage to do what he does. But, but when people call him for an appointment for a counseling session, he says to them, fine, I'll be glad to see you, but it will be next week at this time. And then he says, and I want you to pray 30 minutes every day before you come, and he gets them to pledge to do that on the telephone. He says that about two-thirds of the time they don't even come for counseling because, because they have already prayed through and God gave them the answer and they really didn't need him to give counseling whatsoever. I like that. Now, I don't often read poetry in the, in the pulpit, but here's, here's something that comes from an old poem. I met God in the morning when my day was at its best, and his presence came like sunrise, like a glory in my breast. All day long that presence lingered, all day long he stayed with me, and we sailed the pe in peaceful calmness o'er a very troubled sea. Other ships were blown and battered, but the winds that seemed to drive them brought us to perfect rest. I think I know the secret learned from many a troubled way. You must seek him in the morning if you want him during the day. If you told me this morning that this was my very last year in 2020, if we knew this was our last year, I, I would give my life to Jesus Christ and I would spend time each day with God to make sure I kept in contact with him. Mm -hmm. Then the third thing I would do is this, I, I would balance the books. I'd balance the books. Yeah, I really do believe that most of us go through life with unbalanced books. Now, I'm not talking about your, your checkbook this morning, okay? I, I never am going to be able to balance my checkbook. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about forgiving and being forgiven. Forgiving and being forgiven. Do you know that the Bible is very clear about this? that there is no forgiveness for us if we do not forgive others. Now, I think that's the hardest thing that Jesus Christ ever gave us to do, to make sure that our relationships are right and that we forgive our brothers and our sisters. Jesus told a very interesting story about a man that, you know, went to the temple to pray. 
And when he went to the temple, he brought his offering along with him to pray there. And when he gets there, he remembers that his brother has something against him. Not that he had something against his brother, but that his brother had something that was amiss with him. And so Jesus said, leave, go, make things right with your brother, and then bring your offering." And I want to tell you that as a former pastor, that I would have rewritten that story. I would have said, leave your offering first, and then go get things straightened out because we've got bills to pay around here, so leave the offering, you know. But Jesus said, don't wait. Don't wait for the one who offended you to come and say to you, I'm sorry. And that's hard. That's hard, isn't it? But Jesus makes it very clear. You know, John says, you know, if, if somebody has something against you, then you need to get that settled. Forgive and be forgiven. Someone asked the great jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, what's the most profound thought you ever had? He thought for a few moments and said, the most profound thought I ever had is this fact, that I am accountable. I'm accountable. And someday, there's going to be a judgment, and you and I are going to be accountable. I'm going to be accountable, and you're going to be accountable. You and I are going to be accountable for the time God has given us. We're going to be accountable for the influence that we've had. We're going to be accountable for the resources God has given us. We are accountable for those things. And I believe we are accountable for all the things God has given to us, and we are accountable for our relationships. And I would not want to face God with my books unbalanced. There's an old, old story of a major in the Union Army at the height of the Civil War. It had been a very, very difficult assignment, and they had, they had gone out with all of his troops, and they had been out of the mud and the rain, and they were tired, they were angry with each other. It had been a very difficult day. And they came in at the end of the day, and their uniforms were all muddy and all stained, and their boots were covered with mud. And the, the, the major, in a fit of rage, kicked the corporal who had been assigned to take care of the officer's mess. And when he kicked the corporal, he left mud all over the corporal's uniforms. And everybody around the campfire there saw that. But in the spirit of those days and in the spirit of that war, they just passed it on by. The corporal had obviously been wronged. And night came and everybody went to sleep. And in the morning when the major got up, his bed, his, by his bed were his boots that had been shined and polished. By his bed were, were, was his uniform that had been washed and cleaned and pressed up, laid out for him by that very same corporal whom he had kicked the previous evening. Jesus says, if your brother has aught against you, now I, I, I don't need to push that but I would surely want my books balanced. Because our being forgiven is predicated on our forgiveness. And life is too short, folks, to harbor grudges. It's just too short. Now, if I receive word from God that this was my last year, there's one more thing that I would do. I would speak a good word for Jesus. I'd speak a good word for Jesus. You know, we don't do that very much anymore because we're way too cool, aren't we? I mean, the reason why most of us don't speak a word for Jesus is either we don't have a relationship with him or we don't want to look like those crazy people that do. You know, you know the kind of people I'm talking about? You know, they always have very bad breath. And they grab you by the collar and they wave that 20-pound chopped and chain Bible in your face, you know, and they, brother, are you saved, you know, and something like that. But you see, in our culture, 
Cool Christians keep it to themselves. And cool Christians have what I call the witness jitters. Fact is, we can express almost any harebrained idea we want and run it under the First Amendment, but when anybody speaks about and gives a witness to Jesus Christ, the whole world shuts up and looks at them like they're nuts and crazy. Now, I know most of us would say, well, Pastor Mike, I, I, I want to live a good life before people, and that's certainly commendable. But I've been working with people now for over 40 years and in the church. And I want to tell you, in all those 40 years, I never had anyone come to the altar of prayer and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ because I've been watching everybody's life and watching people. Now, I know a witness can be given that way, but somewhere along the way, it has to become a personal witness. And most of us became Christians because someone, you know, a mother, a dad, a grandmother, somebody, they personally witnessed to us about Jesus Christ. And I'm really of the opinion this morning that modern Christians have a major sin. It's called the sin of silence. The sin of having a bright idea and of having a good experience and sort of bottling it all up on the inside. And maybe, maybe one of the reasons why our Christian life doesn't flow very freely is that there's, and there's no sense of joy about our Christian life is that we keep it bottled up on the inside. Someone wrote a line that I like. It says, impression, impression without expression is depression. Impression without expression is depression. And many of us have been impressed by the gospel, but we don't want to express it. But Jesus, you know, says, come and see. And then he says, go and tell. Let me tell you about Jesus, what he has done in my life, for my family, and for me. Now, I don't know this morning what the year 2020 is in store for you. I don't know what the year 2020 is in store for your family. I don't know what it's in store for me or my family. But I want to encourage you on this Sunday morning to make a commitment to Jesus Christ and his church. I want to encourage you to carve out somewhere in your day. Maybe you're not a morning person. Now, I, you know, I, I wake up at 4.30 or 5 every morning. That's just me. I, I'm, I'm a morning person. My wife doesn't know that there's a morning. You know, it's, it, be, it begins somewhere along the way somewhere. Okay, that's fine. But to carve out somewhere in your schedule, carve out some time to be with Jesus Christ and spend quality time with Jesus. I want to encourage you in 2020, if you haven't already, Balance the books. If there's somewhere a strain, if there's somewhere a hurt, if there's somewhere a place in the family or with a neighbor or a friend where there's, you, know, you just know it's not right. And folks, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But somehow try your best to balance the books. And I want to encourage you to say a good word for Jesus, wherever you are. Don't have to be offensive. Don't have to get in people's face. Just tell them what Jesus has done in you. And see what difference that makes to them and to you when you do it. That's going to be a good way to live the year 2020. So for how many ever days God gives us, let's make them count for Christ and the kingdom in 2020. Would you do that? I believe you will. Would you stand with me, Father? Thank you today. You have been so good to us. You've given us so very much for which we give you thanks. 
We are a blessed people. We sang this morning great songs of praise of who you are and what our hearts respond to your love and grace. We sang about your faithfulness and that you're always there. We, we thank you for, your, for all that you are doing and for all you've done, for the days behind us in which we have experienced the grace of God. And as we look forward, Lord, to all the days you will give us, we don't know all the things out there, but I pray you will help us as your people, that you will grant to us to make a commitment to you and to your church, that you will help us, O oh God, to carve out some time every day, spending time with you to hear your voice and feel your touch and know your direction for our life that you help us balance the books and relationships, and that you help us speak a good word to make every day in 2020 count for Jesus. And Lord, we believe if we do that, it'll be a good year for us. It'll be a good year for Willard Church and the Nazarene. And we ask that and believe that in Jesus' name. Amen.